to the New Grad Success Summit. I am so excited for this session on how to pay off your student loans. Now, obviously, paying off your student loans is a massive topic that we can't cover in just one webinar. So we've chosen today to focus on refinancing, how to refinance, the pros and cons, how do you know if it's right for you, and so many more deep dives into one of the most recommended solutions for paying off your student loans. I'm here with Devin Hughes. He works for Lenkey, which is one of the most top recommended student loan refinance programs out there, and I'm so honored to have him here today. Thank you so much, Devin, for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Emma. Um, well, before I start, I really want to interject. Um, we've got this wonderful presentation, but I want to let all of you listeners know why I chose Devin. And it's not just to promote Lenkey as an amazing solution, but also because Devin was so uh, informative and transformative when I spoke to him about a year ago. I came to him a year ago asking a lot of questions about refinancing. I really didn't know anything about it for myself and for my mentees. And I was blown away with our conversation, his uh, honesty, his sort of ease of how these chip, these maybe difficult situations could be solved and his ability to explain something in a really simple yet thoughtful and thorough answer. And so trust me, he's going to do a wonderful job describing refinancing and answering all of your questions. And um, so I'm really excited to dive into this presentation here, Devin. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> now that I've boosted your ego, right? <laughs> I, I know, yeah. Now I, now I feel like I can talk for hours. This is great. <laughs> well, why don't you first go ahead and talk a little bit about Lenkey so people um, know uh, a little bit more about that, and then we'll deep dive into all the facts about refinancing. Sure. Yeah, happy to do that. So for anyone that's not familiar with Lenkey, uh, we've been around for about 10 years and we are uh, what's kind of called a, a lending as a service provider. Uh, so we are not a lender ourselves, which is probably something that's important to distinguish uh, in the market of student loans, right? We, we are not a lender. We don't have a balance sheet. Nobody takes a loan. It's a Lenkey loan. Um, we provide technology to banks, credit unions, and other financial institu institutions who do offer loans. And they offer great loans, right? They're community-based institutions. A lot of them are not-for-profit. Um, they pass on a lot of those savings to consumers in the form of great rates. Uh, sometimes it means they accept more folks into their programs or approve more folks for loans than otherwise uh, other lenders might do. And they really lean on us to provide the infrastructure and the support for those programs. So uh, when I speak, I kind of speak uh, with the context of knowing several hundred lenders and their student loan programs uh, for the past 10 years. So we have a lot of data. We've seen a lot of instances and scenarios uh, in that time, as you can imagine. Uh, and so we've, we've kind of been through the ringer as it comes to student loan stories and understanding what is and isn't possible, what folks can and can't do, and just a general sense of kind of what are some of the best strategies out there. Um, so as far as our, you know, our, our kind of background, we have an office in New York uh, and an office in Cincinnati as well. So we are completely domestic. Uh, and we've got some pretty big lender clients that a lot of folks have probably heard of, like Navy Federal Credit Union, uh, Dollar Bank, WSFS Bank. These are kind of large lenders um, that, you know, have pretty good footprints and reputations in different areas of the country. Um, and so I think Emma, if you want to go to the to the next one, um, you can see some of the the brands that we work with listed here. Um, and then within our kind of within the company, we've got about 125 employees, uh, and that's broken out kind of what you would expect: a lot of customer service because we do handle all of the customer service, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, and uh, as well as some of the technology and marketing folks like myself. Um, and, and most of those folks are based out of the New York and the Ohio offices. I happen to be remote in Seattle, so for anyone in the Pacific Northwest, you know, go, go Seattle. Um, and then we've got, like I said, we've got about 300 lender clients today, and that's always kind of growing. So uh, all those lenders are represented at Lenkey.com, uh, at, at the website, I should say. What I yeah. really like and about Lenkey uh, is you're sort of like yeah. supporting the, the smaller banks and the underdogs. You know, like like typically you may not, if you go... For someone looking to refinance, you often mm -hmm. sort of search for a, a, a rate, an interest rate, on um, whether it be fixed or variable. And so these bigger companies are going to have these rates. But like Lenkey sort of finds all these smaller banks and nonprofit institutions. And so they're really, you know, finding you some rates that you never would have found with other um, institutions, which I really thought was really neat. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these, uh, the credit unions and even some of the community and regional banks, um, you know, they haven't invested a ton in technology yet. So they haven't really built out like a really robust uh, digital offering. And so they're not being really aggressive in markets like Facebook or Google. And so, you know, you might not come across them as much and you might have, you know, a bank or a credit union down the street that has a great student loan product and you just never heard about it. Right. So we're, we're trying to help bring that to, uh, to the surface. So. Um, and kind of our, our credentials, I guess you could say, uh, our, our platform and our lenders have seen over $3 billion worth of student loans deployed on it. Uh, we've seen and, and work with over 130,000 uh, borrowers today, and, uh, and we've serviced over $2.2 billion uh, worth of loans. So, you know, a lot, lot of loans, a lot of borrowers, a lot of situations. Uh, like I said before, we've seen a lot, uh, and hopefully we can kind of share some of those learnings with you today. Um, so I, I mentioned uh, just very briefly uh, when you go to lendkey.com and this is one of the unique structures of the platform um, and it, it's there's really kind of three components that I think make it particularly useful when you're doing your uh, kind of due diligence and your shopping uh, of a student loan solution uh, particularly for refinancing of which we'll talk about there's you know many different strategies that you can look at uh, when you're managing your student loans. But when you are thinking about refinancing, uh, selection, security, and simplicity are kind of three value propositions that we hold pretty dearly. Um, so like I mentioned, we're not a lender, we represent multiple lenders. So you are kind of doing your good, good due diligence as a consumer by shopping around in one place. Um, security, so we're not sharing your information when you enter it, we're kind of using that to show you what rates are possible for you. And only once you've chosen one of those loans or those lenders do you get access to them and they get access to you. So you're not getting phone calls, uh, you're not getting emails from a bunch of different lenders just by coming to Lenkey. And then lastly, just simplicity, right? Um, even though we represent several hundred lenders, as the servicer of the loans, we don't have to hand you off and you don't have to re-enter information somewhere else. Uh, you just complete the entire process with us and then you move right to our call center staff to handle any questions you might have before the loan is completely paid back. So very straightforward, we try to make it as simple as possible um, and transparent as possible. I think we'll, we'll talk about that here today as well, but you know, kind of giving you an, an idea of what's coming uh, in the future if you decide to take this path. Yeah, I like that you sort of stay within the Len, the Lenkey family the whole time. You know, you find your right. loan and then you're still talking to Lenkey after the loan versus that may be different with other companies. So just a couple of things to keep yeah. in mind. Um, and now we're going to go into the meat of refinancing to help pay off your student loan. Yes. So, um, so I thought I'd start with just kind of a quick visual uh, on, the, on the next page here, which hopefully just as like a 101 gives you an idea of what refinancing, you know, really is. Uh, and at its heart, it's not unlike refinancing other types of debt. And, you know, if you've graduated recently, it's very possible that you've never really had anything to refinance before. Uh, maybe you haven't owned a home yet. Uh, or even a car yet, and so you haven't been in a situation where you could refinance something. So even the term refinance can be kind of like nebulous if you've never come across it before. Uh, but a refinance, quite simply, is just taking out one new loan with new terms, meaning a new repayment period and a new rate, and then paying off with that new loan any old loans that you had, right? So you're really not changing how much debt you have, you're just changing the structure of that debt. Uh, and so what's, what's kind of good to know about refinancing is um, when it comes to student loans, a refinance is always done through a private lender. So anyone that is not the government is a private lender. Any lender on Lenkey, any of the other you know, banks out there that might offer a student loan or a student loan refinance product, they're all private lenders. Only the government is a federal lender. And so the government has a consolidation program where you can bring all of your loans together into one loan, but you're not saving any money on that, probably saving some hassle because you don't have to make more than one payment. Um, but a refinance is a consolidation, but then also the introduction of a new rate and new term. And you're in charge, which is great, right? You can decide whether or not you want to do it. And more importantly, you can kind of see your options before you make any decisions to make sure it's a good fit for you. So I thought this visual was kind of a, a nice representation just kind of to get a better sense of what it is. This would be a refinance, right? You've got 10 separate loans. Maybe you took out a loan every year or almost every year. Each of them have different rates because you took them out at different times. And your new loan is now the sum of those old loans with a new, in theory, lower rate, right? Which is most people are refinancing to get that lower rate. Um, so I thought this was kind of a helpful visual, just 
pure 101 uh, if nobody has ever come across what refinancing really, really means. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of confusion between consolidation, which is basically mm -hmm. taking all your loans because each semester we get a new loan and basically turn it into one loan, but they're averaging that interest rate. It's a weighted average. So even though your interest rate, um, you know, it's, it's lumped together. So it's staying the same right. on average for all of your loans versus this, you're actually lowering your interest rate. So it becomes one loan plus a lower interest rate. So it's not only making it easier to pay off because you don't have to think about debt avalanche, snowball method. There's just one loan to focus on. And then also the interest rate is much lower and every, every percentage point is literally thousands of dollars depending upon how big of a student loan that you have. So it's pretty massive refinancing as a student loan payoff tactic. That's right. Yeah, and like a good example here in this in that visual, yeah. um, if each of the if you were just to do a pure consolidation, right, and there was one loan at eight percent, one at nine percent, and one at ten percent, your new loan, if you were just consolidating, would just be nine percent, right? It would just be the average if they were the same size. So in a refinance, you're shooting for that lower rate, right? You want to go way below any of the rates that you have currently. Yes, and don't worry, everyone. We're going to be going into like the pros and cons and how to know if this is right for you. We're not trying to have this one-sided webinar like you should refinance, but we're just teaching you about a really common, typical, and highly recommended strategy. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great point. I mean, refinancing is one strategy, right? Uh, and there are many others that, like you said, could take an entire day or a couple days to, to kind of talk through. Um, but we'll try to cover, you know, as much as we can here. Um, so as far as like to get down that or start that process of, you know, when is refinancing a potentially good fit for somebody, there are some good milestones to think about uh, for when a refinance might make more sense for somebody than other times. Uh, so some good examples are, like it says here, your personal financial situation has changed, right? That could be a new job, could be a raise, maybe you, you know, you got a promotion. Um, your credit score may have improved, right? Maybe you paid off some of your old credit cards or you got a new credit card and so you've got more, more of a credit limit, which is a factor in your credit score. And if you're ever curious about, you know, how is my credit score calculated? I'm sure Emma's got resources on that, but there are lots of free resources out there uh, to help you with kind of figuring out what makes up that credit score, right? Um, and how you, can, how you can grow it. And uh, kind of on the, on the other side, those first two points are kind of positive things, right? You know, I've gotten a raise or my credit score has improved. Another scenario might be that the monthly payments that you're making are challenging, right? And maybe that's because you're kind of progressing in life. You're, you know, you're really adulting hard. You've just bought a house. You've, you know, got a new family member. I just had a baby four months ago. So this is very fresh. Um, and so these different situations can introduce reasons why somebody might look at refinancing. And fortunately, there's no obligation to go shop around. So these are just good scenarios that make sense to go check it out. Um, another example is if your existing student loans have pretty high rates, right? If they're kind of north of five, six percent, uh, then it might be a good time to check and see what's available to you. Um, the theory or concept of refinancing makes sense when you think about it, right? If you're a bank and you're about to lend somebody money and you lend out money to a kid who's in school and that kid hasn't graduated yet, that's pretty risky, right? Don't know how that's going to end up. But once that kid has graduated and now they've got a job and they're employed and you know, meeting some of the requirements when it comes to refinancing, and we'll talk about those, um, they're much more stable, right? A much less risky investment. And so you don't have to charge as much interest there. So you're much more willing to give them a lower interest rate. And that's all that's happening, right, in this scenario. Uh, and then the other piece is, and we'll, you know, we look at these requirements, you've got a pretty good credit score already. Um, you know, you've got a stable income and your DTI is not crazy. DTI being debt to income. So you don't have a ton of debt maybe outside of your student loans that are making it difficult to make your payments every month. Uh, you already have, or you're about to graduate many student loan refinancing companies or lenders will require that somebody have a degree, um, at least an undergraduate degree, if not a graduate degree, depending on what they're going for. Uh, and then most lenders will also require that you're a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. There are some specialty programs out there that do offer refinances and student loans to uh, folks on visas or kind of international students who are still here in the U.S. Um, so we, you know, those are options out there. There's not as many, but but that is available. So, but for the bulk, like if you're just Googling student loan refinance, most of those lenders are looking for U.S. citizens or, or permanent residents. Okay, good. Very good point. <coughs> Excuse me. Awesome. So as Emma mentioned, some benefits and limitations to refinancing, right? We said that it is 
kind of one of several different strategies. So let's kind of dive into when it's good and, and what are some of the, the limitations for it, right? Um, so it, kind of showing here kind of your benefits and your limitations on the left and right. On the benefit side, as we've talked about before, and I think overwhelmingly the most common reason that we get in our feedback channels from our borrowers as to why they refinance, it's to get a lower rate, right? And a lower rate brings with it lots of benefits, right? You're saving money over the life of the loan because interest is just the ratio or rate at which you're multiplying your existing balance. And so the lower that rate is, the lower of the interest that you're paying over the life of that loan. Um, in many instances, you are also reducing your monthly payment, so you're freeing up some cash flow on a monthly basis that you can put to use in other ways. Um, that might be strategically to pay off other high interest debt, maybe credit cards, or it might be used to, you know, um, go towards a new mortgage, maybe a new car, other, you know, important expenses that you're now encountering uh, that you need that cash flow for. Um, the, another benefit is going to be changing your repayment period. Uh, so this is also called your term of your loan. Um, so when you take out a loan in school, uh, you usually are picking a certain term and it might not be super clear or you might not even remember it because it was a couple years ago. That's okay. Uh, but when you look at refinance options, uh, you can also change the repayment term. And so I think you might have to click one more time. I've kind of staggered these to, to show up here. Oh, cool. um, but the uh, but when you when you play with the term, you're basically um, structuring the loan how it's going to fit best for you and your financial situation. So a longer term, maybe a 15 or a 20 year repayment period, sounds long, right? But that's going to make your monthly obligations or your monthly payments pretty low because you're stretching it out over a longer period of time. Um, versus uh, another popular option is to choose something very short, like a five-year or a seven-year payment period. Those monthly payments are quite a bit higher because you're paying it off quicker, but you're paying much less interest in total by the time you've totally paid the loan off. So the good thing is when you go through many, many sites like Lenkey, you can see what your options are, right? You'll see a five-year term, seven, 10, 15, and a 20-year term, and you'll see what the total cost of all of those are, and you can pick what's going to be the best fit as you're trying to obviously balance the lowest monthly payment with the lowest cost. Um, and then the last one is just to control your debt. So there's other aspects outside of the pure economics of a loan that can be helpful in a refinance. We already talked about consolidation, uh, where by having just one new loan, it kind of saves you some headache by only having one monthly payment to make versus three or four or five, depending on how many loans you took out over the course of school, right? Um, uh, and then uh, a lot of folks when they were in school might have had a cosigner uh, because many folks who had to take out private student loans had to have a cosigner on there that might be mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, a guardian, a spouse, something. Um, and those folks have been on those loans for a couple of years already and they're ready to get off those loans and, and not be on those anymore. And so you can typically just apply to refinance loans by yourself. Um, you can refinance with a cosigner as well. That's not to say that you have to drop that cosigner. Uh, a lot of folks will come in with a cosigner because a cosigner can help you get better rates if they've got good credit history. And there is a cosigner release function as well within the refinance loans at Lenkey. So after one year, uh, if you qualify on your own, that cosigner can just be released. You don't have to take out a new loan. You don't have to apply again. They'll just take them right off. Um, so that's a helpful piece as well. And then the last one is sometimes uh, today, more popularly, uh, we've got parents taking out loans in their own name for a student, right? So in uh, some cases, you might want to take that debt away from your parents. You know, thanks, mom. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for helping me out here and taking that, that $10,000 student loan or that $100,000 student loan. Um, you know, I'm working now. I can, I can take that from you, right? Uh, and so you can, you can take those loans and put them in your own name since technically they were for you. So those are just a couple examples of some of the helpful benefits of, of refinancing. But similarly, there are limitations, right? So um, the first one is most folks have federal loans, right? Uh, if you've got student debt, it's likely that some or most of that debt, if not all of it, is federal loans. Uh, they're typically the first type of loan that somebody takes out, and there's good reason for that. They're pretty flexible in their repayment. Uh, they offer things like income-based repayment programs. Uh, in healthcare, actually, what a pretty popular program is the Public Service Loan Forgiveness track. So if you are pursuing a nonprofit employer or working for a nonprofit hospital, that might be a path that's available to for a free um, that you're probably already familiar with if you're watching this 
uh, this session. Uh, and then they offer things like forgiveness and death and permanent disability. So there are some advantages to federal loans that private loans typically don't support. Um, and when you refinance and you take that federal loan and you turn it into a private loan by refinancing with a private lender, uh, then you are no longer uh, access, or no longer able to access those particular benefits. Um, so you might ask the question like, well, well, I guess one of the reasons why somebody would be willing to maybe forego some of those things are they don't work in a nonprofit, so public service loan forgiveness isn't really something that they were worried about anyways. Um, they're making pretty good money and they feel pretty stable in their job, so they don't need this income-based repayment option that's going to say, if I lose my job, my payments go to zero. Um, and obviously, hopefully, nobody is thinking about death or permanent disability. Um, and in some cases, private lenders do offer something like this uh, as well. So. Um, just something to, to keep in mind. A lot of times people are kind of weighing these pros and cons and they think that the immediate relief in a substantially lower rate can justify some of the risk in some of these other areas. Definitely. Um, if, I can, if I can interject, yeah. I agree 100% with that. Like whenever I talk about refinancing, I ask people a lot about their situation, like what we did in the other slide. You know, what is your situation like? And especially for careers, like where do you see yourself now and in the future career-wise? Some people just do not like working in hospitals, which is the most common nonprofit. Some people don't like right. working in schools, which is another common nonprofit. So if you know right away that those are the settings that you're not going to work in, that your likelihood of forgiveness through a nonprofit is very, very slim to none, then this is a good option for you. So really when you're thinking about refinancing, think about all those situations and where you see your career and try to, it's, un, it's unfortunate, we're in an unlucky situation where we almost have to predict where we're going to be in our lives five to 10 years from now, because that's how long public service loan forgiveness takes. It takes 10 yeah. years. And so if you don't think that you can be working in your career for 10 years, that you can be in a nonprofit for 10 years, doesn't have to be consecutive, but if you can't do that, then this is an option for you. So a lot of people, I speak a lot about public service loan forgiveness and there's a lot of pros and cons and there's a lot of risk with that, just like there are a lot of risks with refinancing. So just like Devin said, do a due diligence with your life, with your future, and then come back to weigh the pros and cons of does the benefit of having that flexibility of potentially getting forgiveness down the line, granted you still have to pay those 10 years of your student loans, does that outweigh just getting it done in a couple of years? Sometimes I tell people that, I'm like, okay, you could maybe find a nonprofit, but then you'd have to work 10 years. And let's just hope the system works. Let's just hope you filled out your paperwork right. Um, you know, all those other variables versus with refinancing, at least I know what I'm getting myself into. There's this really clear cut contract and it forces you to get these loans over with. These loans are such a burden because of so much anxiety, depression, stress. And sometimes that alone versus doing the public service loan forgiveness is it outweighs itself. Just to be knowing that you have this plan and it's structured and it's for a couple years and then you're done and you can just move on with your life and whatever you want to do. Um, I so. agree. <laughs> yeah. Completely. Very well said. You, you, I mean, the, I think one of the things to, to also consider is that refinancing is, you know, a, a permanent decision in terms of taking those federal loans and making them private, but a potentially temporary decision when you think about, you can refinance more than once. Right. So if you refinance and you choose a 10 year term and all of a sudden those payments get to be a little much, you can refinance again and maybe move to a 15 year term or 20 year term and push that out. Right. Hopefully not. Hopefully you're moving the other way and you say, wow, I can actually afford these payments and I'm going to, I'm going to move these into a five year or you can just pay ahead. Right. So you can always, you can always kind of play with the, the structure in a refinance. You're not kind of in stone. Um, you've got options. So it's, it's not to say that this is a one time I only get one chance to do this and that's it. Um, you can certainly kind of revisit this, this decision on a regular Definitely. basis. So. And yeah. Lenkey doesn't have any prepayment penalties. So if you want to go conservative True. when you refinance and say choose 10 years, you can, your goal can be to pay it off in five years, but you have that 10 year payment so that you, gives you a little room for error in case you say have a house or a baby, something that can yeah. affect those finances. So you can always pay. Yeah, it's, 
it's kind of like the equivalent of the rainy day plan, right? So we do see a lot of folks, especially with higher balances, which will come with higher payments, um, refinance to a longer term, even if they can afford a shorter term monthly payment, because that longer term monthly payment is lower and they'll just pay more every month, right? They might say, well, that 10 year payment is affordable, that 20 year payment's much lower. I'm gonna take the 20 year loan I'm gonna make the 10 year payment, so I'm gonna accelerate, I'm basically gonna pay it off on a 10 year schedule, but if, if for some reason things got tight one month, my minimum monthly payment is still pretty low, pretty affordable. Yeah. So that's another kind of common strategy that people will use. So again, you kind of consider your situation, consider where you're at in your career, and think about what's gonna be valuable to you, and, and you can kind of use that to help make your decision. Um, so two other kind of limitation categories I wanted to cover. Amounts saved may vary. We just kind of talked about how, you know, if you take a longer term, you're kind of stretching that payment out, right? And so when you do that, the total cost by the time you're all said and done might be more, right? But maybe it's worth it for you to have that free cash flow now because things are tight. You're maybe early in your career. You know you're going to be earning more over the next three, four, five years. But right now, it's a little tight and I need that cash flow, right? Um, so depending on what options you choose, uh, that amount that is saved can be different, right? It can be tens of thousands. It can be you don't actually pay more, but you're doing it for reasons that make sense, right, for your budget. Um, and depending on what your credit score is, what rates are available to you may vary as well, right? Fortunately, you can see that before you make any decisions or, or commitments, so you don't have to be taking on new loans or, or rates that, that don't make sense for you. And then the last one is just availability. Um, so depending on your, you know, your credit worthiness, because these are new loans with a private lender, you do have to qualify with your credit history and your income, right? Your DTI, I mentioned some of those things, uh, and then be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. So it is possible that based on some or one of those, one of those factors, refinancing might not be able to be available to you right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it could in the future. Definitely. And there's lots of easy ways. I talk a lot, um, often about like improving your credit score and it's actually really easy to improve your credit score and you can do it with just sort of a couple steps and you'll see your points really rapidly jump and so it's smart to maybe test the waters you can see what your refinance um, interest rates may be and then if you're not liking them go and try to think of ways that you can improve that that's often what i teach is how can you improve that before you refinance so attacking mm -hmm. your credit score is a really big uh, way to do that trying to pay off some debts that are sort of you know floating around that are causing you to have bad credit or you know maybe if you have late payments something like that trying to fix those little things can really improve your credit score which then can lead to a better refinance right and then also improving your income if you try to really strategize and get the highest uh, salary that you can get that's going to help you also with um, refinancing because you'll look, like Devin said, you'll look like a sort of a safer bet um, because you have a higher earnings. Just a yep. couple side exactly. tips there. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, so it's very possible that we may have lost you kind of early in this with some terms uh, <laughs> that uh, that you might not have heard before. So I know this will be recorded and you can go back and watch it later, but uh, I also wanted to introduce maybe a couple terms that are really good to know that are commonly associated with the process of refinancing or what you're considering when it comes to refinancing. And I kind of broke them out into two categories. So, uh, so fees and then comparing your options, great. So within fees, there are a couple terms that you'll probably come across, right? Uh, when you're kind of doing your, your good consumer thing and shopping around and, and researching. Um, application fees, origination fees, and prepayment penalties. Emory already mentioned prepayment penalties. So a prepayment penalty is quite literally just if you were to pay off a loan earlier than it's scheduled to be pay off, paid off, sometimes a lender will impose a penalty on you because they've, been, they've kind of conceptually lost potential interest revenue, right, before they, they would have earned it. Um, and many lenders today actually don't have any of these fees, which is great for consumers. Um, it's kind of table stakes now for anyone has a, who has a student loan product or a student loan refinance product to have zero application fees, zero origination fees, and zero prepayment penalties. Um, application fees, literally just a fee to apply that's kind of dated, maybe more typical in other types of loans. And origination fees, a little bit different from an application fee in that 
the fee would only be incurred once you took the loan or, or kind of signed the, the loan agreement. Um, but like I said, it is very common today for student loan and student loan refinance companies to have zeros in all of these, which is great. If you and do Lenski see that- no fees, correct? Correct, yes, okay. no fees there. Um, and if you do see that there's an origination fee or a prepayment penalty, um, you know, you might take that as a little bit of a red flag um, because it is pretty common for, for folks not to have those. Um, so unless that is coming with, you know, an extremely attractive rate for some reason um, that you just can't see anywhere else, that's probably, you know, a reason to avoid a potential lending program that does have that. Um, in the comparing your options sections, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about the process of refinancing your student loans here in just a little bit. Um, so this will probably be a little bit more easy to understand when we talk about the process. But um, typically, kind of chronologically, the process starts with a rate check. Uh, I've mentioned this before, there's no obligation, right? And Emma, you mentioned this, when you go to Lindkey, you enter in some information about yourself, we're able to show you what rates you qualify for. In fact, it's the best rates from the several hundred lenders that we work with in a rate check. And how are we able to do that? We do what's called a soft credit pull of your, of your credit history. Um, when you apply for a loan or a credit card, or sometimes even when you open up a bank account, uh, or if you buy a car, kind of all these different reasons, um, a lender might do a credit check on you. And generally that's okay, right? Um, it'll show up on your credit report. If you go to the credit bureau, like a TransUnion or an Experian or an Equifax, and you log in, you can see that, oh, I just bought this car and I see that the lender, you know, looked at my credit. Great, that makes sense. If you do that too frequently, that can hurt your credit score. Um, and so it's important to know when a soft credit inquiry is happening and a hard credit inquiry. The hard credit inquiry is the one that actually shows up on your report, and if it happens too frequently, it can lower your credit score. A soft inquiry, you can do as much as you want. I do it every day, and I'm not joking, <laughs> because I'm testing the site and testing our partner sites and making sure that everything's working, and I'm using my personal information to do it. So you can do that as much as you'd like to your heart's content, and you'll be okay, right? No obligations to take the loans, and no impact on your credit scores or your credit score won't go down, Nothing. Is, there's no cost or fees or anything associated with a soft credit pull, right? Um, the hard credit pull is, is usually only something you do, it is necessary, but you only do it once you've chosen the rate that you want to move forward with. And that's the best part, is that you don't actually take that hard credit pull and you don't pay any fees, um, but you, you only take that hard credit pull once you know that this is the right loan for you. And then lastly, conditional and pre-approval. So the, these are terms that are usually associated with um, somebody who has submitted an application to refinance and immediately the lender will come back and tell them whether or not they are pre-approved or conditionally approved. That typically means that if everything that you told us so far is true, you're gonna get the loan that you want. And all that's left is for you to prove some things. One, we need some ID. Two, we need to verify your income, so that might be providing some pay stubs or a W-2. And three, we need loan statements. So if you say you have $50,000 worth of student loans, we need to see those loan statements so we can pay them off to the penny um, so that we know exactly how much your new loan should be. So we're not giving you a, a larger loan than you need, right? So assuming that the documents that you provide are gonna show that to us, then that's what we mean by conditional approval. Here's the rate that you qualify for. Assuming what you told us is true, that's the rate you're gonna get. That's what that means. And then term, we talked about this um, a little while back, but term is just the length of repayment period. So it's usually referred to in years, and the most common repayment periods are between five and 20 years for a refinance loan. Um, anything above 20, again, you're just kind of weighing the value of a lower monthly payment now versus paying more over time because the longer the term, likely the longer, uh, or sorry, the more interest you're paying over the life of the loan. So your goal is generally trying to get the lowest monthly payment that you can afford um, while having the shortest term. So you're paying it off as quickly as possible. Now, I know you're gonna dive into fixed and variable, Devin, right? Uh, yes. So, okay, perfect. And so maybe when you go about that, you can explain also sort of like, how does one even think about choosing the term? Because I know that I think that could be overwhelming for someone to try to be like, I don't know if I need 10 or 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to do that now or should we wait for fixed and variable? Because I know that that can sometimes uh, influence it. Well, we can, we can talk about it now. I think fixed and variable is actually next. So it's a good kind of segue. Okay. Um, when I think about term, like I said, I, my, my goal is generally to take the, I should say, the highest monthly payment that I can afford 
somewhat comfortably, right? I don't want it to be extremely stressful every month if I can avoid it. I want to have enough to cover my other bills, maybe a little bit to go out to dinner or go to the movies and maybe put some aside, right? Hopefully we're saving money here for retirement and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully student loans aren't completely shutting that down. Um, so assuming we can do all of that, then I'm, I'm trying to choose, I'm trying to marry the highest monthly payment with the lowest term. And that's generally what happens, right? A five-year loan is going to have a higher monthly payment than a 20-year loan. And so I'm really trying to choose um, the, the shortest term with a monthly payment that doesn't stress me out completely. Um, that's kind of a general strategy, right? Um, because that way I'm paying it off as quickly as possible. Every day that that loan isn't paid off, it's accruing interest, right? And that interest over time is what makes these loans more like way more expensive and kind of hiddenly expensive, right? Like, cause you know, you have maybe 30 or $50,000 that you took out for school, but if you do the math on these, it can be kind of scary. You see, if you pay them off in 15 years or 20 years that you've actually paid two or three times that amount, right? That Definitely. interest adds up pretty quickly. Every, every year. Um, adds. <laughs> every year yes. and every percentage counts. Exactly. So, so like I said, I'm trying to get to a point where I've got a monthly payment that is comfortable for me and my budget or as comfortable as possible. And then if I can, I will try to pay ahead of that. And we talked about that strategy, right? So for term selection, that really means I'm trying to find the term that offers me the best fit for a monthly payment if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes exact sense. And for people wondering, well, if I choose a five-year term, why is it so expensive? What's well, really not expensive, it's because you're paying the loan off in five years. So they're calculating right. how much does that, how much monthly do you have to pay in to get that loan to zero at five years? That means you're going to have to pay more each month because you're paying it off sooner. So the loan payments are different not because they're charging you any more or anything like that. It's because you are having to pay them off in different time increments. And so it's going to take different, different monthly payments to pay off in that time increment. Yeah. In fact, it's actually quite the opposite, which is kind of weird to think. The, lo the shorter the term, typically the lower the rate yes. as well. Right? So not only are you saving because you're paying it off quicker, you're saving because you're paying it off quicker at a lower rate, right? So every month interest accrues, but when you're paying it off in five years, that's a lot less months than 20 years, right? So there's less time for interest to accrue on that. And from a lender's perspective, it makes sense too, right? I always, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of working on the lender side, so that's always a lens that I have on, but it makes sense, right? What's more risky? loaning somebody twenty, you know, $20,000 to pay you off in 20 years or five years, right? If somebody plans on paying you off in five years, that would strike you as a less risky investment. So you're willing to give that person a lower rate because their plan based on the term they've selected is to pay you back quicker. Yeah. So that makes sense. So in summary, everyone, cause I know that could be a lot of financial jargon we just went over is <laughs> take a look at, at your monthly bills, you know, go log into whatever bank you have and look at some monthly statements and that will give you a good indication of sort of what you're spending every month and subtract that from what you're earning or what you will be earning. And then that will be the payment that you know that you can comfortably maybe add a little buffer in there, but comfortably make. And then if you can try to, you know that you're going to grow in your career. You know that you're going to get raises and move up the ladder. And so try to think as best as you can and predict the future and then pick a repayment period that is as short as possible. Because like Devin said, one, peace of mind, you're going to get that loan just done faster. Two, it's going to be a, uh, a lower interest rate, so you're going to be saving money on interest in general. And then three, less months of being charged interest, so you're also going to be saving there. So basically, triple benefits to if you can choose the lowest term possible. But we also want to make sure that you're meeting your payments, because if you don't meet your payments, just like any other you know, banking institution, there may be penalties, late fees, et cetera. So really make sure that you're doing a financial deep dive when you're choosing these numbers. Yes. And there's some Good. more numbers. Devin's going to jump into, uh, oh, we've got some, let's see. I think I got to click one more time. There we go. So this is another mm -hmm. really common question I get. So I'm really excited that you put this on the PowerPoint here is fixed versus variable interest rates. What the heck are they and how the heck do we choose the best one? 
Yes. So I would say, gosh, a, a majority of the folks that refinance will refinance into a fixed rate. It's a little easier to understand. It's simpler, um, although the rates tend to be just a little bit higher. And I think it's kind of easier to think about the difference between fixed and variable rates, again, with my lens as being the lender, right? A fixed rate is a rate that will never change for the life of your loan. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long term you choose, that rate will never change. A variable rate is usually pegged to some sort of index. What is an index? Well, an index is something that a bank will use to say this is something that is generally accepted in the market as a base or something that we peg our rates to and then we add some margin to it. So a variable rate is kind of comprised of two different things. It's comprised of this, this base, right, which is the, the index. Um, so like LIBOR, uh, prime rate, you can kind of Google these things to see how they've changed over time. These are indexes that banks use. And then they just add a fixed margin on top of that. They say, we want to make, you know, 1% or 2% or whatever it is. And so they add that to whatever that base rate is. And so that variable rate can change because those, those indexes change, sometimes monthly, sometimes every three months, sometimes every year. And so with a variable rate, there's a little, uh, a little risk because you're not sure what's going to happen. In this environment we're in right now, it's actually pretty good, right? Rates are, are pretty good. So, um, so and, and they've been actually even better in the, in the past months and years. They've been going up a little bit recently. Um, and so if you've got a variable rate, you're exposed to the risk of whether or not these indexes go up or down. And that's why people who don't want to mess around with that and don't want to like monitor these indexes, they'll choose a fixed rate because it's just easier and they know, they know what it's going to be for the life of the loan. And so when you come and you, and you apply to refinance and you look at your options, you're always going to see a fixed rate and a variable rate and you're going to be able to choose between them. And there's going to be one of those for every term. So for every five year term, there's a fixed rate and a variable rate option, seven year term, fixed rate and a variable rate option and so forth. So you can choose, right? Because a variable rate is generally cheaper. You just don't know if it's going to stay cheaper. So that's kind of a good way to think about it too, right? Is, you know, if I'm the, I'm the lender and I'm now exposing myself to making less money because you're choosing a rate that can change, I might charge a little bit more um, in margin for that than a, than a fixed rate. So it just depends on what you see at the time of your application. And um, you, can, you can kind of choose what makes the most sense for you. Most folks are more accustomed to a fixed rate because the federal loans are all fixed rates. So they've already gotten used to the fact that their rate has never changed and the idea that their rate could change feels a little foreign to them and maybe a little scary. And so they just kind of default to what they've been, what they've been using or what they've been paying in the first place. Um, but particularly if you're in an environment where you know, rates are generally kind of low or medium, then it, you know, a fixed rate can make a lot of sense. You might hear this more frequently with regards to like mortgages there's uh, there's like periods of time where you'll hear like blitzes of advertising about refinancing your mortgage it's generally because rates are low and so all these lenders are trying to go you know steal borrowers from other lenders because they're like rates are low you can get a better rate on your mortgage and so that might be something that you hear and and sounds somewhat familiar this is a similar concept right um depending on what the rates are at that time uh then it can help you decide between a fixed and a variable rate so I have, a, I have a couple questions about variable because I get these a lot from my mentees and I don't really know the answer. So say you chose like a five year term, how much, and I know this is hypothetical, but like really how much is a variable interest rate going to change within five years or say within two years? Is it really going to change dramatically? So if the folks asking this question are able to invest like a few minutes into it, they can get a much better answer than I can provide. It's not much. In a five-year period, I guess I would generally say it's, it's not much. Um, you know, it could be a percentage point or two, but if you're talking about a three or 4% rate, that's a pretty substantial increase, right? Um, but if you've got like a six or 7% rate and it goes up by, you know, a quarter of a point, okay, like I don't like it, but that's not a huge deal, right? Um, but what's helpful is you, you, the lenders will always show you in their variable rates what they're pegging to. So I mentioned LIBOR as an example, right? So if you go to the rates and fees link, Linky has one, all lenders have them. If you go to the rates and fees, you'll see what their variable rate is comprised of. And like I said, there, there, there's those two, two elements, right? There's the margin that the lender sets, and then there's the index, which might be LIBOR or Prime. Well, if you just see, okay, this lender uses LIBOR, and then you just Google LIBOR history, you can see what LIBOR has done every month like into when it first started, right? So you can see like, okay, in a five-year period, how volatile can it be? 
Um, and you can answer that question, like I said, more because I don't know these off the top of my head, but you can answer that kind of better uh, for yourself in that way. But, you know, when you're talking about like a 10 or 15 or 20 year term, you know, there can be some pretty substantial swings in there, uh, gotcha. you know, because that's, that's long enough for kind of an economic cycle. And so you could see, you know, rates double or have uh, in those times, especially because, like I said, we're starting with relatively low rates, right? I mean, all these rates are kind of generally sub 10%. So, you know, you're, you're starting with a pretty low number to begin with. So, you know, having that makes a big difference or multiplying that, um, depending on how much you multiply it by, can make a big difference or it can be just kind of annoying, <laughs> depending gotcha. on, on what that. No, that's great. See, I didn't, I didn't know that. So, and then my other question is, is, like how how much does like economics like our current economic uh, stability play into it? So, like you know, saying we have a presidency change or things like that, does that really affect these indexes? What are if you know? I'm not sure. This is a hard question, maybe. But do you know what are some of like the big things that affect these indexes? So it's really yeah, the, the rates are kind of influenced by the market in general. So yes, okay. I mean a president or an administration can impact what's happening in those rates. It's usually driven by what that administration's goals are, right? So in, in the current administration, they're pretty pro business. Um, <laughs> so they're trying to make uh, make rates you know more attractive to facilitate more business happening. And so you might see rates be a little bit more favorable right now. Um, but it's, it's just, a, it's kind of based on, on time as well. So, um, so I would say, yes, there can be some influence there. I don't think that it's influence that you can realistically predict. So when you're thinking about like, can this influence my decision? Um, I'm not confident, at least for myself, that I would be thinking about whether or not this administration stays in the next election, for example, as a key driver of which type of loan I choose, um, because you really don't know <laughs> what's, what's going to happen, right, uh, in any election. So, uh, so I would try to stick to the things that you, you know, that you know, um, and that you are in more control of, like, you know, your earnings, your career, uh, your expenses, right? Um, and use those as your drivers. Although it, it, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt to consider these things. I'm just saying from a, you know, what am I actually in control of and what can I make my decisions right. and my actions based off of? Um, that's probably a better, a better area to, to focus your time and your efforts. But, um, but the, the kind of very, very high level answer is yes. They, you know, an administration can influence rates for student loans, just like they can influence rates for mortgages and for small business loans and everything else. Oh, I know that's a very fair, honest answer. Um, and I learned, I learned a bunch there. So no, that was a great answer. Cause I was always curious. I was like, so as a stock market dips, will the interest rate affect it and things like that. So yay. But now I'm really excited to get into some more nitty gritty and talk about how to actually refinance. Yes. So this is kind of our, our last piece here. So hopefully, you know, folks have gotten a, you know, a better understanding of generally what refinancing is and then ideally kind of how that can apply to your student loans and your student debt and whether or not it makes sense for you. Of course, you know, I know Emma provides tons of resources for you um, and as does, does Lenkey at, at our site in our resources section. So, you know, if there's questions that you have that we haven't covered today, I'm sure Emma can write a stellar post about it because you're probably not the only one. Yes, um, and perhaps uh, I can, yeah. for those of you listening and on the replay, Perhaps I can convince Devin to come back for a live Q&A. Um, surprise, I didn't tell him that I was going to ask this. So if you're really interested in Devin coming back, email me um, or share on social media and let me know. And I'll try to pull his arm to come back and we can sort of do some more live conversation to help with this question. That would be fun. <laughs> uh, okay, so this last piece on just the steps to refinancing. So this is, I think, a good way to explain kind of step by step what to expect when you go through the refinancing process. So there's no surprises for you. Um, everything is online, right? And we do have phone support as well. So if you get to any point in this application process and you're like, oh, go, oh, I don't know what's happening or I don't know where to get this information, then you can just call us. You'll talk to a real person. They're out in our Cincinnati office. Um, they're very, very friendly. And so, um, so we're, we're always kind of there to help you. Um, but there's really just kind of five main steps, right? Uh, and hopefully they're very, very quick for you. Um, the first piece is just understanding what your rate options are. So I mentioned this before. You go to Linky.com, you, you fill out an initial form. There's probably 10 or 15 fields that you fill out that help us determine your eligibility and what rates you qualify for. You should, I would, I would think, know most of this off the top of your head, if not all of it. So it's going to be like your name, where you live, um, where you graduated school from, what kind of degree you have, how much student loan debt you have. 
and how much money you make. Um, we're not verifying anything yet. We're not asking for documents or pay stubs or any of that nonsense. Just, just tell us, type it in, and that's all we need for now. You'll hit submit and you'll get your rate in about two or three seconds, super quick, right? And that's kind of the big piece in this evaluation is, is the second step is picking your loan, right? Which one's gonna be the best fit? And we obviously spent a good amount of time today talking about that, but you know, between the term, fixed and variable rates, you know, what, which one is the best fit for you and your, and your finances. And hopefully it saves you a ton of money in your process, right? Um, once you choose that loan and by choose, I mean, click, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, you click on that loan that you want. Then we need to verify some of the information that you told us in that first form, right? So that's where we're going to ask for some pay stubs. We're going to ask for a picture of your driver's license or a passport, some sort of government issued ID, and then your loan statements for any loans that you want to refinance. And we didn't talk about this, but you are in complete control of what loans you refinance. Student loan refinancing does not mean that you refinance all of your loans. You might have a couple federal loans and a couple private loans, and you want to keep those federal loans federal loans because of some of those benefits. Totally fine. You can decide which loans you want to refinance. You don't have to refinance all of them. So you're only going to give us the loan statements for the loans that you plan to refinance. And that process is very easy too. You can take a picture with your phone, upload it that way. A lot of folks can get pull their pay, uh, pay stubs down from like ADP or some sort of online HR portal. You can send us PDFs that way too, kind of drag and drop. So very easy to, to get us those documents so that we can confirm the information that you told us when you were rate shopping. We look at those documents, we come back to you and say, great, thanks Devin, everything looks like it's, it, it should. Uh, you told us the truth, that's great. The rate that you were conditionally approved for is now yours and you can sign your loan agreement and you will be done. That is a DocuSign integration. If, you, if anyone has ever used that, literally you just click and type your name, check a box and you're done, right? So all in all, you know, it might be like 10 to 15 minutes worth of effort spread out over a couple days. Um, and we actually take the, the process of taking the, the new loan monies from the bank that you just refinanced with uh, and paying off those old loans for you. So you don't even have to do that. All that happens is, you know, I can go to Lenky.com, log in, see my account. I can see my history. If I've, you know, uh, every payment I've made, if I've made extra payments, if I need to change my address, all of those account management kinds of things you can do in the portal there that you would imagine uh, or that you could think of that you would need to do. So that's the entire process. Hopefully there's no surprises there. Um, and like I said, our call center staff is always available. Uh, you can chat them, email them, call them. So if you're ever confused about a certain term or confused about uh, you know, a document or something, they're more than happy to, to answer those questions for you. Awesome. Well, yay. I really think we did a great job covering as much as we could cover in a reasonable amount of time. Devin and I talked a lot about, you know, how to discuss refinancing in sort of a really digestible way that wasn't overwhelming. So hopefully everyone listening feels confident, feels comfortable with this topic, with this idea, and potentially now this is something that's on your radar as a really easy and highly recommended option to help you pay off your student loans. Um, I really appreciate your time here, Devin. For those of you on this summit listening, um, if you would like Devin to come back to answer any more questions, just comment below or you can email me and we'll see what we can do about that because we're here to serve you and we want to make sure that we pay off those student loans. That's like a mission of mine. I'm sure that's a mission of Devin's. And so we want to be there as much as we can to try to help you. And also, if you do decide to refinance with LendKey, I have partnered with them on a mission to pay off student loans. So when you use the link below, it's a bit.ly link slash LendKey free money, you're going to get $200. And that's automatic. It comes when you refinance. And so that's just part of the partnership agreement that we have, you know, to try to help you on your path to debt freedom. Um, any last words of wisdom, Devin, before we let you go? <laughs> um, you know, I thank you again for, for having me, Emma. I always appreciate the, the chance to, to speak about, you know, education. I think from, a, from the moment I joined Lenke, which was six years ago last month, if you can believe it, um, you know, we've always had in our mission to help educate borrowers and help, uh, actually, our, our kind of mission statement is to make lending simple. Um, and uh, improve lives with lending made simple, and and I think we you know we try to do that every day in every aspect of the of the programs that we run, right? 
um, whether that's you know me coming here and trying to help people understand what their options are, whether that's somebody who is halfway through the application process and having a question, calling in, having a you know a customer care rep willing to spend hours with them to kind of make sure they understand what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. Um, that's always been a key mission of ours, and I think that also reflects the type of lenders that are that are using our platforms, right? Credit unions, community banks, regional banks, right? These are kind of very community-based and community-focused institutions that care a lot about customer service and they care a lot about education. Um, so, you know, don't rush into anything. Uh, you know, if you have more questions, you know, like Emma said, comment, let us know. We're happy to try to answer them. Um, you know, make sure this is a, a comfortable and informed decision because um, it's, you know, it, it should be a good one. It might not be the, the funnest of things to talk about, right? A student loan refinance, but I think it, it probably has um, one of the largest, if not the largest financial impact for a new grad um, than any other type of financial transaction because you don't, you might not own a house yet. You might not own a car yet. So refinancing your student loans and saving 10, 20, $30,000 might be the single biggest way to save money for you right now. Um, so it's a big deal. Um, and hopefully we're, we're able to help you learn and, uh, and, you know, kind of feel more comfortable, uh, as you go in, into the market and, and figure out what's best for you. And thank you so much everyone for being on this webinar and watching us and check out our other amazing new grad success summit masterclasses. We're talking about how to become a telehealth therapist, non-clinical careers, how to write your resume and cover letter interview and negotiate like a boss, time management, audit proof documentation, and the list goes on of amazing experts in healthcare that are speaking about topics that are going to just kickstart your career and help make you the most confident and competent uh, clinician that you can possibly be. So check all that out at www.newgradsummit.com. Thanks guys, and we'll see you later.